Oh my goodness. Um, thank, thank you all for rolling up. I would not have rolled up to see me. Um, uh, many thanks to Studio 23 and uh, Creative Mornings and Jolinda for doing the thing that I've always wanted, a captive audience that has to listen to my philosophy lecture. Um, suckers, like welcome. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I have, I've prepared like some remarks, right? Like it's not, um, you know, uh, this isn't terribly rigorous, but rather I have some remarks. I'm hoping they'll go pretty quickly so that we can have a little bit of a conversation afterward, you know? Um, but uh, what did I call this thing? Oh, right. So this is a bootleg phenomenology of curiosity. This is how I'm, I'm going to phrase it. Is everyone familiar with phenomenology? No. <laughs> we don't have enough time for that lecture, so all right. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay, to investigate, we're gonna um, uh, do like Aristotle and we're gonna set out from the appearances, okay? Um, so we're gonna start with what our culture indicates to uncover what our culture obscures. Can you dig it? Yeah. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's say, for the, for the beginning, that curiosity is a desire to know. Now, Aristotle opens the metaphysics by saying that all human beings, by nature, desire to know. So if you want to be an ancient Greek about it, then we could say at the outset that we're always curious all the time because we couldn't be otherwise if we're human beings. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case because culture or the zeitgeist or whatever, if you want to call it, seems to encourage and discourage curiosity. So on the one hand, the curiosity rover is on Mars, like taking selfies, you know, furthering scientific uh, knowledge or whatever. Um, also, we look back with nostalgia and a sense of wonder um, about the, that we had when we were younger. Remember when you were like a kid and everything seemed like amazing and you were wondering what was going on? And we want to encourage the same thing in our kids. We, we always encourage our kids' curiosity, right? Um, we sit them down in front of the TV where they watch uh, Curious George go on learning adventures. Which, side note, I watched an episode of Curious George when I was thinking about this. And like, there's nothing curiosity happening in, like, Curious George is an inconsiderate asshole monkey. <laughs> All right, but also uh, people who aren't me say things like, there are no stupid questions. Um, and, they're, and in doing so, they are encouraging, right? They're encouraging engagement, you know. Um, another one, when Frederick Douglass was a young slave, uh, his path to freedom started when he had the realization that he had to learn as much as he could about the world. And to do this, he had to learn to read. Literally, his will to knowledge his curiosity, I think we can say, like helped him get free. Uh, yet at the same time, on the other hand, there are serious checks to our desire to know. Um, one of history's great racists and the father of weird fiction, H.P. Lovecraft, has one of the dopest paragraphs in all of literature. Okay, I'm gonna read the whole thing for dramatic effect. So when I'm done, I need you all to go, woo, okay? <laughs> The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Yeah. No, you're right, it's very spooky. Okay, here's another one. Everybody know about Indiana Jones? Um, Indiana Jones beats the bad guys and survives the movie precisely because his curiosity doesn't get the best of him. Oh, the Nazis are opening the ark? Close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
oh snap, uh, the, the Nazis found the Holy Grail. Nah, I leave it. We're going to get out of here. Uh, you know, he wants everything to be in a museum, but he has limits. Um, and of course, there's uh, Curiosity Killed the Cat, uh, a, a stern warning that makes everybody but cats hesitate. <laughs> so look, this, this dialectic uh, goes on forever. Um, you want your kids to be curious about the world, but you also want them to stop asking all those goddamn questions and go the fuck to sleep. <laughs> Or like, okay, one more. We're like, we're filming this, right? How much money do you make? I'm just curious. Right, see? That not so up on curiosity now, are we? Um, so I think we feel the promotion and suppression of curiosity equally, which means that we can't, or we can't actually see curiosity as an absolute good. Um, but I do think that this conflict reveals that curiosity isn't simply a desire to know, but a kind of orientation to that desire. Like maybe curiosity is the will to act on the desire to know, or it's the passion that motivates that action. Um, okay, so the conflicting messages about curiosity that we get from culture, they're legit and they're worth listening to. Um, it's probably true that there are big rewards and big costs to acquiring knowledge. In other words, ignorance is bliss and knowledge is power until they aren't. The rapper LP has a hook in a song that says simply, this is the sound of what you don't know killing you. One way to think about curiosity is in terms of the high costs of ignorance. The ignorance tax is no joke. We like to think about not knowing in terms of the fear of missing out, like, oh, I didn't know you had a party, why wasn't I invited? But it's not so much fun to think about losing money because you didn't know how to invest, or breaking up because you didn't know how to communicate your stupid feelings. Um, all of these are things you could have learned a long time ago, dummy. Um, a person who understands this will be ignited by the drive to learn. But here we find another problem. In knowing, you become a knowledge mirror of your world. And we live in America, your world's kind of shitty. Um, the totality of our education, social interactions, discourses, cultural products, all of that stuff, in America, all those things come out into a kind of patriarchal, Eurocentric, homophobic, ableist mess of a whole, and we can see it in our habitual reflections. All right, here's a fun game. Have you ever heard or, or perhaps said the following? Can I touch your hair? No. <laughs> uh, or like, or that, that shirt looks good, man. No homo. Um, or how about this one? If it was a big deal, there'd be more news coverage about it. Or, uh, okay, here's a, I, I got these for days, but here's some more of my favorites. <laughs> oh, you went on a volunteer trip to Africa? Did it change your life? <laughs> um, or, uh, you know what this girl needs? An unsolicited dick pic. <laughs> <laughs> no? All right. Just me? Okay. Um, uh, and then there's, a, there's another one that, I, that I've heard a lot since I moved to Richmond, which is, uh, this neighborhood is sketchy. He said of any neighborhood that had black people in it. Um, so all of these things, they reveal the shapes of our consciousness, the way in which we see the world, the way in which we privilege ourselves and our perspectives over others. Curiosity then, is not neutral. When you speak, you speak from your horizon. When you ask, you ask from your position. One of the hardest moves to make is to realize that the ways that you know the world are always leaving people out, excluding people, and hurting people. The desire to know, then, must also be a desire to know the different ways of knowing. To figure out how your quest for knowledge can manage 
not to hurt people or yourself and expand what it is that you think counts as knowledge in the first place. How did the Arab world understand the Crusades? What does an Indiana Jones movie look like from the perspective of one of the indigenous tribal dudes shooting arrows at him? Anybody ever seen Gremlins? What's the Chinese dude's story at the very beginning of the movie? Why is he out here selling Gremlins? <laughs> is he getting like revenge on American imperialism? Like one pet at a time? Anyway, there can be no curiosity without sociality. You are not alone. Your activities affect others, and in fact, part of what ignites your passion should be the passion of others about their projects. You need the passions of others in your community. The myth of the lone genius is a plague on creativity, obviously. But that means we have to strive to get in tune with other ways of knowing. Curiosity should encourage responsible investigation. It should encourage it, not get in the way of it. One of the problems of our desire to know these days is that it is fleeting. So I might be cooking, right? And then I wonder, like, what's the capital of Cameroon? And then I'm like, hey, Google, what's the capital of Cameroon? Um, and it triggered my phone just now. It was like, what, Chucky, you said something? Um, and then I find out, and then uh, I know it in that way. You know how you know something for like five strong minutes and then you forget it? Um, and, then it's, and then it's over, right? And, like, and whatever that original spark, that original spark of inquisitiveness, it's extinguished. Um, and also my chicken is burning. I'm a very bad cook. <laughs> but we need more passion. Passion ignites curiosity, but also, I think curiosity is deployed skillfully or without skill. If you're bad at it, the highest level of knowledge you can achieve is good for trivia night, and not much else. In order to go deep, you have to be ready for a sustained investigation. I think all uh, truly curious people are also very adaptable people, because they have the passion to learn and it's coupled with the patience it takes to learn something well. But look, uh, the more knowledge you acquire, the more difficult it is to live whatever life you were living previously. That's how knowledge works. It makes it impossible for you to go back to the way you previously saw the world. And that can suck. It can also set you free, but it can also suck. You might want to flee into the peace and safety of a new dark age, but you can't. You've seen behind the curtain. This is your life now. So uh, to be curious is to be willing to die, or at least to be willing to kill the parts of yourself that relied on your previous state of ignorance, right? Like, dude, it's 2018. Stop describing yourself as a nice guy. Um, uh, conclusions? I don't know. Um, I've worked as a journalist. The journalist's curiosity is aggressive. Uh, they need to know the truth. What's up, Mallory? Um, and the best of them just straight up will not stop in, until they get it. A side note, I hope you're listening to podcasts. Um, I'm also a philosopher. The philosopher's curiosity is obsessive. Um, the great Emmanuel Levinas says that philosophy is insomnia. The insomniac never falls asleep because they are perpetually falling awake. People who don't get this um, in conversation are prone to say things like, we're going around in circles, not understanding that you can see new things when you come back around for a second look like maybe you can see the ocular bias of my whole entire talk and wonder what it would sound like if a blind person wrote it. I'm also a motorcyclist. Um, the motorcyclist's curiosity can be, in, can be aimless, like escapist kind of. I think our desire to know should take all of these forms if we're to become better people and you know, better artists. 
Okay. Uh, curiosity killed the cat, it turns out, is only half of the saying. The full saying is, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. I think that the meaning is clear. Uh, we should all strive to be the undead zombie cats <laughs> of knowledge, right? Thank you. Where do we go from here, you guys?